Hello there. Welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and revisit some of the earliest crimes. Before we talk crime, let's talk coloring. I will be stamping and coloring the all to new Magnolia Grandiflora stamp that I purchased because I love magnolias and I had to. I will be stamping this on Nina Classic Crest Solar White 80 pound cardstock with Simon Says Stamp Intense Black Ink so that I can color it with my Copic markers. This is the type of magnolia that grows where I live. I was trying to get this color. I did not succeed, but it still turned out really pretty. Um, after I am done coloring, I will put the panel back into my stamp positioner and ink it back up with the Nocturne Clair um, let's see, it's called Versa Claire Nocturne Black Ink to make sure that we have some really nice dark stamped lines. And then off screen, I will use my brother scan and cut to cut out the image um, and create a card. So now that we are finished with all of the coloring details, let's talk about our crime. Our alphabetical journey today takes us to the state of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania was part of the original territory of the United States. It was chartered in 1681, although New York did not relinquish its claim to the area until the following year. The southern boundary was resolved with the survey of the Mason-Dixon line in the 1760s. Connecticut had claims to Pennsylvania territory, and that was resolved by, the, by an award of land of, in the Continental, Continental Congress, words are hard, of 1782. Pennsylvania ratified the U.S. Constitution on December 12, 1787. It was the second of the original 13 colonies to join the Union. Pennsylvania assumed generally the same boundary as the present state with the acquisition of the Erie Triangle from New York in 1792. And Pennsylvania is one of four states that are legally described as commonwealths. William Penn founded the colony of Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania holds claim to some interesting tidbits of history, like being home to the first national zoo, the Philly cheesesteak, and the Hershey, Ch Hershey Chocolate Factory. It is also the place where the first American piano was built. It is the location of the largest stone arched bridge, and it is where the Crayola crayons were created. Pennsylvania is bordered by six states and one lake. The American flag was created in Pennsylvania. Gettysburg, Pennsylvania is home to an important battle in the Civil War. Pennsylvania had the second most people serving in World War II. Pennsylvania is home to the first complete Tyrannosaurus skeleton, the first computer created, the first daily newspaper published, and is one of the original 13 colonies. The Pennsylvania Dutch language is still spoken in Pennsylvania today. Pennsylvania is home to Puxatawney, oh, I can't even say that, the groundhog, Puxatawney Phil, <laughs> and is the only original colony not touching the Atlantic Ocean. Pennsylvania is home to the first baseball stadium, has the second largest Amish population in the U.S., and Pennsylvania is home of the murder by defenestration, which is one of my husband's favorite weird words of the day. One thing about this alphabetical journey where we revisit crimes committed long ago, sometimes the background is hard to track down. And our story today is a good story that I totally chose because of the word defenestration, but there's not a lot of background in our, in our, to our cast of characters. So I think you'll find the story interesting. It definitely poses some questions, but anyway, let's get into it. Mary Wirtz was born in 1803 in Philadelphia County, Pennsylvania to Margaret Wirtz. Uh, Mary's father is unnamed. Like, seriously, no records found. I could not find even anything about Mary's life until her marriage to Samuel Hill. Samuel was actually born in 1776 in Philadelphia County with no date or month listed, and his father's name was Adam, but there's no record of his mother's name. And it seems that both Samuel and Mary spent all or most of their lives in, the, in Philadelphia. 
At some point, and I don't know how, Samuel met Mary. Presumably they fell in love because they were married and had one child together, a daughter named Camilla, who was born sometime in 1831. Now we have another gentleman named George Sullivan Twitchell Jr. And he was born to George and Emily Twitchell in 1841 in New York. And he is the oldest of their five children. Now I can't find much about their lives either, except that they are listed as residing in the Philadelphia South Ward in the 1850 census. And unfortunately, Emily's death date is listed as November of 1852. One record showed that George Sr. had two wives, but they were both named Emily on that record. So I'm kind of wondering if somebody just double entered her name. Anyway, total sidetrack. Now, Records show that in about 1864, Camilla Hall, Mary's daughter, had been hired as a housekeeper for a widower named George Twitchell, and he lived on a farm near Carpenter's Landing, New Jersey. So sometime after the 1850 census, George Sr. Um, left Pennsylvania, probably after his wife's death because he was... Um, recognized as being a widower. Um, he took over a farm in New Jersey. Now, I don't know how Camilla got hired as a housekeeper as a young unmarried lady in the 18th century, but somehow she did. Anyway, shortly after taking over the farm, George Sr. was joined by his son, George Jr., who had been away attending college in Connecticut. So clearly the Twitchells were a family of some means. Um, I don't know other than farming what they would have done to earn their money. Now, Camilla was about 10 years older than George, which is kind of unusual in this time frame. But upon meeting, apparently the two became romantically involved and eventually they eloped to New York City sometime in 1864. And George and Camilla lived in New York for a short time, but then moved back to Philadelphia, where George engaged in the, and I'm using air quotes here, produce commission business. Now, I kind of did a little bit of research on that, and if I'm understanding it correctly, George was the go-between for produce farmers and the sellers of the produce at the Spruce Street Market. George was not great at it. This He was unsuccessful at this business. And eventually, he and Camilla moved in with Camilla's mother, Mary. Mary was also a recent widow. Her husband, Samuel, was a contractor, and he died quite wealthy in February of 1866. And upon his death, Samuel had left Mary in a state that had an, an abundance of funds. Now, Samuel and Mary had normally lived um, a more um, unpretentious lifestyle. They lived within their means. They tended to not be snooty or show off that they had some cash. But once Samuel had died and George and Camilla moved in with Mary, they convinced her to change that lifestyle. They wanted to have a more opulent life. So they convinced Mary to start spending a little bit more money and to um, flaunt it a little bit, apparently. Like I, I say this like I was there, but according to what I read. <laughs> so with a new source of revenue, George went into business again, and this time he was manufacturing shingles in Camden, New Jersey. So I don't know if he moved to New Jersey or if he just ran a business in New Jersey from Pennsylvania. I mean, right now, it's I mean, like today, it's not a huge commute, but back then it would have been a really long commute. However, he failed at this as well. And in November of 1868, the business went bankrupt, leaving George pressed for money. I imagine with a bankrupt business, he would have creditors wanting to be paid. In spite of all the push toward a different lifestyle and probably asking for more money, the Twitchells appeared to be on, the, um, on really good terms with Camilla's mother. 
the servants in Mary's home said that they got along well. And they all continued to live together in Mary's home, living on Mary's money, her inheritance. Around nine o'clock on the night of Sunday, November 22nd of 1868, Sarah Campbell was a servant of Mary, was returning from church. But the door was locked and she had to ring the bell repeatedly before George came to answer the door. Now, according to Sarah, George was just partially dressed as if he had already gone to bed and then tossed on some clothes to go answer the door. According to Sarah, when he opened the door, he remarked how cold it was and then said, quote, I wonder where mother is, definitely implying that Mary was still outside, that she had not returned home. George let Sarah in and returned to his own bedroom. Sarah opened the door leading to the, the yard and was horrified to see the dead body of Mary Hill on the brick pavement between, beneath the windows of the sitting room. She called for George, who came out exclaiming, What is this? <sighs> he and Sarah, George and Sarah, carried the body of Mary into the kitchen, and Camilla came downstairs in her nightclothes, found her mother, found her husband washing her mother's face with a wet cloth. The neighbors were called, the doctor was sent for, and they were met at the door by Camilla crying, mother has been killed. She fell out of the second story window. Of course, that leads to a, a investigation of the second story sitting room. So this examination of the upstairs room revealed some drops of blood on the floor of the dining room and the sitting room. And there was blood on the windowsill of the sitting room. George's shirt was found and it was bloodstained as well. Camilla claimed that her mother always carried a large sum of money, two to three thousand dollars in her bosom. Okay, we won't even talk about that. And was in the habit of telling people about it. The money was not on Mary's body when she was found, and Camilla believed that a burglar had murdered her mother for the money. Now, it seemed unlikely to most people that a burglar would risk capture by throwing the body out of the window, the very definition of defenestration. George and Camilla, who were the only occupants of the home house at the time, became prime suspects, because of course they did, and they were arrested for the murder of Miss Mary Hill, sorry, Mrs. Mary Hill. Now, George was tried first, and I didn't find records of um, the coroner's inquest. I did not really find a very detailed record of his trial. What I did find is linked down below in, in, the, in, in the box down below. However, so George was tried first and the evidence against him was circumstantial, but it was strong. So part of that evidence was testimony from a real estate broker named Joseph Gilbert. Joseph testified that George had convinced him to put George's name on the deed to some property that George was supposedly purchasing in behalf of Mary. Joseph also said that whenever anyone else was in George's presence, he acted as if he was on good terms with his mother-in-law. But at other times, he offered and referred to her as an old, bad word, B word, <laughs> and Joseph remembered him saying he wanted to kill the old woman. Um, other evidence that was presented at the trial was that Mary was murdered in the dining room and fresh cigar ash there indicated that the, her killer was familiar enough to Mary to sit down and smoke while they talked. The prosecution claimed they were arguing about money and he became angered and decided to kill her, he being George. First, according to the prosecution, George went to the kitchen to obtain a larger fire poker than the one that was in the dining room. I guess the one in the dining room was dainty. I don't know. 
George returned and used the larger poker to beat Mary to death. And then, in an attempt to confuse the evidence, he threw the body out of the window, then went outside and placed the body, sorry, placed the bloody poker, fire poker, under her body. He removed his bloodstained clothing, went to bed, and waited for Sarah Campbell, the, the servant, to return and find Mary. Now, the defense had some, some, you know, they argued some things about this whole prosecution case. They argued that, first of all, George had an ex exemplary character. Now, he has two bankrupt businesses, so exemplary might be a stretch, but he did not have a history of violence, nor did he have a history of bad behavior. He was not known to be a drunk. He did not was not known to visit um, women of the night or beat his wife or, you know, be crabby at people. So he generally had a good reputation. Also, the defense claimed that George and his wife did not stand to gain anything by Mary's death. Samuel, Mary's husband's will, stated that the estate would go to his wife until her death, then would be passed on to his relatives, not hers. Hey, I have questions about that, but we'll talk about that in a minute. None of the missing money that Mrs. Hill was allegedly carrying on her person could be traced to George either. Like he didn't go start spending dollars or paying bills or whatever. Um, the defense claimed that the murderer had been done by someone or the murder had been committed by someone outside the family because obviously nobody in the family would, would hate Mary enough to kill her, I guess was the, the idea there. The blood on George's shirt. So the defense claimed that George's shirt got bloody because he went outside and carried Mary back into the house. And then the defense had a witness named Charles Altgett who lived nearby. And he claimed that he saw two men leaving Mrs. Hill's house when he was out walking at about nine o'clock that night, his description was kind of vague. One was tall, wearing a long coat. The other one was, he didn't have much of a description of it all. But the thing he noticed was that the entryway to Mary's home was dark, not lit up as he would have expected it to be. So before we go on with the prosecution's rebuttal to that, can we talk a minute about Samuel's will? After Mary's death, the remain whatever was left over from Samuel's estate was to go to, quote, his family, not hers. But wasn't Camilla his family? So if you remember the beginning, Samuel and Mary's records that I found only listed the name of one of their parents. But Camilla, she is listed as Samuel's daughter and as Mary's daughter. Um, did Samuel not like George? Or did he disinherit his daughter when she went to work for a widow, the widow George Sr. out of state? I really do not know, but man, do I have questions. Man, do I have questions. Anyway, back to our story. The prosecution pointed out that the blood on George's shirt was not smudged as if he had been carrying a bloody body back in the house, but was covered in sprinkles or splatters, the same as the walls of the dining room, splatters that, that could only be accounted for, quote, by an open artery or the dash of a weapon upon a bloody surface. So they're attempting to introduce in the 1800s blood spatter evidence. Additionally, Witnesses testified that George was not wearing his shirt when he carried Mary's body back into the house. Remember, he had appeared when he let Sarah, the servant, into the home as if he had gotten dressed quickly and then went back to bed. So some people are saying, the defense is saying, that when Sarah screamed and yelled that Mary, you know, found Mary in the yard, that George didn't get dressed that time or partially dressed that time. I don't know. 
The prosecutor gave no significance to Mr. Allgett's testimony at all. He did not even address the idea of strangers leaving Mary's house. The jury was sent to deliberate, and they deliberated for an entire 13 minutes, and then returned the verdict of guilty of first-degree murder. After George's trial, Camilla was tried and found not guilty of the murder of her mother. Now, not only could I not find anything about Camilla's trial, I can't find anything about Camilla after the trial. I can't find that she moved, that she was remarried, that she had a child. I cannot even find a photo or a sketch from a newspaper of, of Camilla. Totally weird. Totally weird. She literally dropped off the face of the earth. George was sentenced to be hanged, but his execution was delayed because he filed appeals. His defense filed a request for a new trial on a number of technical grounds, and the new trial was denied, and the case then went to the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, which also said, no, the lower court's ruling is fine. With no more appeals possible, the hanging was scheduled for April 8, 1869. On April 3rd, George made a confession of sorts. He claimed that on that night he had been in bed when his wife came in and said, quote, I have had a quarrel with my mother and killed her. George claimed he then helped Camilla throw her mother's body out the window. Defenestration. And he made a solemn vow to the eternal God, that's another quote, that he would never reveal what had happened. However, after his conviction, he believed that his wife would come forward and tell everything. And she did not. So he decided that with his execution just five days away, he was going to break this vow and tell the truth. Now, I will tell you, the general public did not believe the confession. George was now considered untrustworthy, and nothing he said changed the way that the people believed the evidence. Even if his wife had wielded the poker, the blood spatter on his shirt indicated that he must have been standing next to her. But even if she did it, Camilla had already been acquitted and could not be retried for the murder. One matter was settled by the confession. It proved that the murder had been committed by one or the other of the Twitchells, and Mr. Algott's tall man with his long coat was proven just a myth or even a lie. Most Philadelphians were now satisfied that George's execution was justified. On the morning of April 8th, when George Twitchell was to be hanged, the jailers found him lying dead in his cell. George had cheated the gallows. He committed suicide by taking prussic acid, a.k.a. cyanide, and it was never determined who had supplied it for him. Okay, I have questions. What happened to Camilla? Why couldn't she have the money left by Samuel? Why did George's defense attorney introduce a witness who said he saw two men without checking in to make sure it's true? Did he actually create that lie in order to have a defense? I don't know. I have questions. The card is finished. The magnolias are pink, not cream. I'm 100% going to color that stamp again and try to go a little bit lighter in my coloring. I found a picture of George. This is a sketch from the newspaper of about what George looked like at the time of his trial. I found a picture of Mary. This is about what Mary looked like or a sketch of what Mary looked like at about the time of her death. Nothing about Camilla. No sketch, no physical description, no, no nothing. I have questions. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today and listening, watching my video. I have a couple of other videos I think you might like. I've added a subscribe button. If you have not yet subscribed, I would love it if you did. Give my video a thumbs up. Tell YouTube you like it. Leave a comment down below. What happened to Camilla? And have a really great day.